and as you can see it is wet and rainy here in the Sabi Sands. We are probably going to head back into camp now to uh, not risk any of our equipment. So uh, we will keep you guys updated as to if and when we do head out again. Keep an eye on Twitter. But the rain is coming down. Great news for the Sabi Sands and the drop that we're experiencing. Not great news for the safari this morning. But that would be selfish of us to uh, complain about that. We need every drop of rain possible. And sadly, like I said, we just don't want to uh, risk any of our precious equipment that gets these live broadcasts to you guys. So uh, keep an eye on Twitter. Um, we'll use, I guess, maybe YouTube as well for some updates. We will keep you guys updated as to what we're doing. But for now, we are seeking shelter. So see you guys later. Hopefully, I don't know how long the storm is going to be here, but we will keep you posted.
we're back and it's a pity the rain did not continue we need every drop we can get like i said earlier but it does mean that we can now go out on safari and see what's happening here at juma um already got off to a good start we are not far from camp and already one of the characters that we so often see after rains the tortoise is out and about and this little speaks hinged back tortoise is going to certainly be making the most of the moisture that has just fallen it's probably going to try and lick leaves to acquire as much moisture as it can get they'll also try and drink out of small puddles in the road but sadly i can't see any nearby for animals like tortoises though droughts can be incredibly dangerous because they don't have the ability uh, to move easily over large distances therefore if it doesn't rain they can really find themselves in trouble so good news for this individual not only for drinking but also for its food just going to drive straight over the middle of it it's about 26 degrees celsius uh, which is around 76 degrees fahrenheit it's a cool morning um, the wind was howling when i woke up I'm not too sure um, what it was doing while I was asleep. I was dead to the world. And it literally started raining about 10 minutes before we went live. And it really increased in intensity. So we did have to seek shelter. Whether it starts up again, it's hard to tell, but we're just gonna head out and see what happens. Um, I have tried my hand at predicting the weather, but I've never been much good at it. So. I'll just rather go out, see what happens. If we have to return, we have to return. If not, what a bonus. Now, Sam is also out on the other vehicle uh, with VM on camera. They're actually just up ahead of us there. Um, and some of you may not have met Sam before. He's here on interview. And he's already done one drive yesterday morning. I thought he did an incredibly good job for his first drive, as I'm sure a lot of you do as well. But be friendly, as you guys always are, and let's see what happens out here. So you'll get to see him a bit later. Nikki's in the final control room with Kirsty, and I'm teamed up with Dave on camera. Oh, there's wind. Now, usually in windy weather, game viewing can be quite tricky, so... We must brace ourselves for that. But cool weather is great for predators still being on the move. So that is something to look forward to. Positive outcome of this potential, oh, of this cool weather and rain. Halal Bonner, yes, Brent is on leave. He will be back along with Jamie, I think on the 4th of March. And you've mentioned, that you do not know how we get up so early in the morning. Well, um, I think most of us love our jobs, so that's a good prerequisite um, to getting up early in the morning. And on top of that, we do get to snooze during the middle of the day, sometimes for many hours. So don't worry, we do get time to recharge our batteries. But certainly, uh, after six weeks of waking up in the dark, uh, a sleep in can be most appreciated and most enjoyed. There are no two ways about that. Ah, Marianne in Arkansas. You've already put through a wish for the safari and that is that we could hopefully find the heavily, heavily pregnant female elephant and i like where your head's at that is uh, a good thing to be hoping for i've never seen an elephant give birth the only animal i've actually ever seen birth was with some of you guys on my first ever live safari in november 2014 and that was a wildebeest giving birth here on the quarantine clearings very close to us but I guess what we can read into that is that you can go, and many guides will go a whole career never seeing an animal give birth. So let's hope that your positive thoughts get us into the right place at the right time. 
Our plans are to head to the eastern boundary and see if there's any signs of the Inkohuma Pride and possibly the Birmingham males following them back. I think VM's also taking Sam in that direction. He actually snuck ahead of us there. Um, so I think that's, that's what VM's doing. VM will be helping Sam with directions. And failing that, they do have a little GPS. So they should only get varying degrees of discombobulated, nothing too serious. It sounds like the second tortoise has already been found with Sam, so why don't you guys go over and enjoy it with him? Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Savi Sands. As you can see, we found ourselves another tortoise. How oh, very exciting. It's another hinge tortoise. Um, so we've got two out here, we've got the leopard and the hinged tortoise. And it's, it's been an incredible morning so far. We, I woke up and I was excited again for my next round of interviews and, and uh, it was started raining and I haven't seen rain like that for a long time. And so it's great to see that the rain is back um, and that it's going to be bringing a lot of water to this area. So how exciting. Um, but we can see two tortoises this morning, so they're very excited about the rain as well. They're not lying in their beds or hiding away. They're getting out and looking for the new shoots to eat this morning. So already we've had a good morning. But it's good to have you all back here just to let you know. My name is Sam Chevalier. Um, I came on my first morning drive yesterday morning, which was, I had such a fantastic time. Thank you very much to all of you that were there and participated. And that first drive of mine, I was very nervous, and you all made me feel very comfortable. How were those hyenas? It was in incredible. I've never actually experienced um, hyenas playing water like that before. That was once a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm sorry if you weren't there. That was Penny Pine. Did I get that wrong? I'm not sure. Please let me know. Uh, uh, have, I, have I ever seen a tortoise being blown over by the wind? Um, I can't say that I've ever seen a tortoise being blown over by the wind. But I have, in fact, seen a tortoise that's been upside down. And I uh, went I went and helped it out. And that was, that was actually, I think, two years ago. Uh, but generally, I don't like to, to like influence and put my hand in the bush. I think it's, um, morally, I don't think it's a good thing because it doesn't help them learn and experience and teach themselves how to do it again. So where we can, we've got to let nature be and realize that you know, we're also a part of it. Um, but I, you know, one, help, one can't help but have sympathy for someone on, who's on his back. So. Oh wow, guys, so it looks like we found ourselves another tortoise. We're going to link over to Scott and I'll see you just now. Welcome to Tortoise Live, everyone. This is now a different species of tortoise, the leopard tortoise. And look at how much it is loving drinking out of this puddle. I mean, obviously, we don't know how much longer it was here before we arrived, but it is certainly downing this water as if it's the tastiest thing it's ever drank. And I don't blame it. It's probably been quite some time since it last got to quench its thirst. I would have liked to see it running towards this little puddle in the road. I'm sure it was moving at high speeds once it did finally lock targets. I've never seen a tortoise put its neck so far out either. It's called the leopard tortoise because of its very 
leopard-like colorations, you could say, certainly distinguishing it from the Speaks hinged back tortoise that you've seen with Sam just a few moments ago. They also are more kind of a, of a ball shape. The Speaks hinged back tortoise are flatter, they're not as rounded. And off it goes. Now a big reason why you should never touch tortoises and pick them up, I know you were just discussing with Sam if he's ever helped a tortoise turn over from its, if it's fallen down, upside down. And a big reason why you should never handle tortoises, especially during dry periods, is that they will urinate as a form of self-defense, losing very precious liquid. So that urination could end up causing it to die. It's, I guess, not a, a true pee, as it is discharging precious, precious liquid. Interestingly, I have seen tortoises fighting before. I think it was over a lady, and the one tortoise flipped the other one over onto its back. So it is something that can happen naturally, whether or not they have the power or luck to be able to turn themselves back over. Well, that's, I guess, what Mother Nature's got destined for them. Wonderful stuff. Off it goes. Would you like to know if predators will ever be hunting during very heavy rains like we just kind of experienced uh, as we went live initially? And yes, Boyd, certainly it's a perfect, perfect hunting condition for predators. The prey cannot hear, they cannot see. There's already a state of chaos and confusion that the predators don't even need to contribute to. Uh, the odd flash of lightning may also help the predator and that the prey may lose its whatever night vision they may have slowly acquired. So, yes, I think a lot of kills are made during heavy rain, but this is just a speculation of mine. Um, of course, there's variables. I mean, if a pride of lion is asleep and it starts hammering down with rain, I don't think they're all of a sudden going to jump up and be like, come, let's go hunting. It's a good opportunity, not necessarily, but you can imagine if a pride of lion is kind of pursuing a herd of buffalo or a leopard is keeping an eye on a herd of impala and then the heavens open, it's going to be a very good opportunity for them to snipe forward and attempt to make a kill. Um, but yeah, sadly, in all my career, I haven't spent huge amounts of time with animals or these predators in the pouring rain but I feel strongly that they will capitalize on that chaos and confusion, like I say. They can't really hide anywhere, so they may as well make the most of it. Hello, Joey, AKA the monkey man in Australia. You would like to know what is the largest leopard tortoise I have ever seen? Well, the one behind us there was probably about that big, um, which is kind of ha the, uh, half a melon, half a green melon, the average green melon. I would say is a good uh, kind of description of how big that one was. The biggest leopard tortoises I've seen would probably be half the size of a soccer ball um, in this area and in other parts of South Africa they do get far larger further south of us um, in in the, in the Cape region the leopard tortoises do get considerably larger so it does depend on where you are but the biggest ones here in the Sabi Sands I'd say is half a soccer ball good we're gonna send you across to Sam who is at the hyena den Welcome back everyone. Here we are at the Hyena Den. It is my first time here at the Hyena Den, so I'm very excited to actually see and experience this place. As you can see, one of the hyenas, the hyenas are looking slightly miserable. 
but uh, just lying there after the nice rains. And we've got some hyenas up in the den itself. And, you know, so me being first, like my first time and being new here, I really don't know which hyena is which. So if any viewers know some of the hyenas, do you think you can let me know and help me out and uh, just give me some tips on, on how to learn a little bit more about these hyenas? But as you can see now, you can see the youngsters are out. Your, yesterday, when we s sat next to that uh, water, watering hole and we watched those much older ones playing, it was an incredible sighting. And you know, I've only really seen it with youngsters. And, and so it's great to actually watch the youngsters play and, and watch the adults play yesterday, or sub-adults. Um, it's incredible to see how, how, I wonder how old it, does any of the, does any of the viewers know how old these pups are? I'd love to know. I know uh, apparently they're somewhere around January, uh, November, December. Um, which one is November? Which one's who is who? Give me some tips. I'd love to know. But look at them playing. Hey? One thing I, I think I didn't mention yesterday and I was lying in my bed last night thinking, you know, those jaws are so powerful and they were they were just playing with each other with those jaws like just taking little bites but not really really taking a big bite and look at them playing they really get in there with their with their jaws i mean did you know that a hyena's jaw is strong enough to even crack the bone of a giraffe i mean that's uh that that's quite sheer power right there oh sweet man The rains really have brought a lot of joy to the bush from what I've seen, or especially to the hyenas. They've had a fantastic time. Look at them. Sweet, and it's, it's great to see the difference as they're growing older with the, the much darker fur when they're youngsters to, to how they actually start developing their spots. And yesterday we had two of them coming to our vehicle and just sniffing around and having a look and seeing who I am, you know. Who is Sam? Why is he coming to Juma Game Reserve and having a look at me? Wow, look at them. Oh, sweet. Oh, well, sweet, man. Oh, sweet. Guys, I just got such a great update from Kim B, who just explained to me which one was which out there. Um, November 1, December 1, and January. I think that, that's how it went, but I think I need to spend a little bit more time with each one to start figuring out which one is which. Um, so hopefully if I do get this job from the interview, I will get to spend a lot more time with, with these youngsters and, and get to show you guys a lot more of them. Um, so thank you, Kim B, for updating me on the hyenas here. Um, it was it was really informative, highly appreciate it. Um, and I'll spend a lot more time IDing them and getting to know them a bit better. And I hope that you will be here along with my experience, learning from them and watching them grow and seeing what differences evolve over time with the youngsters and, and what social dynamics will begin to play out as they grow into their later, later years. But while wow, they are really having a good time this morning. And apparently, uh, I mean, as I said yesterday, I was sitting, sitting at home, uh, no, two, three days ago, sorry, when I was sitting at home about to come to Juma Game Reserve. And I was sitting in my room in Hout Bay in Cape Town. And I switched on my computer. And there was James Hendry 
and Scott Dyson, who I hadn't met before, were sit sitting here, probably somewhere around here, and um, the lions came out of nowhere. Like, it was, I was hooked. I just couldn't stop watching the screen uh, to see what they were doing, and they, you know, the, the, high, the lions actually got on top of the den, and you know, it was, I got very excited. Huh? It, was, it was great to watch that. And so it, it just shows you, you know, the bush is so unpredictable. You, know, you never know when, when uh, a predator might come out of yeah, anywhere. So as much as they are playing around here, I'm sure they will always be aware of things that are coming and, and moving around the bush. Oh, we've got two standing up here. Hyenas are ex exceptionally, exceptionally interesting creatures, and I look forward to learning more about their social dynamics. As I think most of you will know that they are ma matriarchal, so the females run this den. And I, I am told, and I've learned that it's it, it can be quite a harsh lifestyle for some of the males uh, when they're youngsters um, because they rear up the, the ladies and, and, and bring them up so that they can be matriarchs. So sometimes it can be quite difficult for a male. Um, ooh, can you smell that, Liam? Lovely, eh? Wow, that's, a, that's quite a powerful smell. I wish you guys all over the world could smell what I'm smelling right now. What do you think that is, Vim? Probably just the hyenas. Yeah. <laughs> mm, can I describe it? Can I describe that smell? Vim, can you describe that smell? Yeah, five-day-old buffalo carcass. Yeah, somewhere around a five-day-old buffalo carcass. There we go. So try and having a, a conversation while having that up, up your nose. <laughs> But I guess you get used to it after a while. Billy Joe on Twitter is telling me that I should be careful of them taking out some of the tires. Uh, yes, thank you. I will be very, very vigilant. I'll maybe put up one of those, of those GoPros next to my tires to make sure that they're not coming to get them. I'd hate to start this job and, and be responsible for losing all the tires to the vehicles so that you guys couldn't see the beautiful hyenas. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Billy Joe. I'll, I'll definitely take that in mind. I've had, as I said yesterday, some very interesting encounters with hyenas. Um, just sleeping and just sleeping out, and, and hyenas kept coming into our our campsite, and I I still didn't know like what the dynamic of it. Well, look, just just before I go into that story, look at them all playing. The youngsters are all playing on top there. It's, what a great sighting! Uh, that's beautiful. But as I was saying, you know, I wasn't you know, wasn't used to the way in which they, they are, and they kept coming into my campsites, and I got very, very scared, hey, I must say. I used to wake up, wake up everyone in my camp. <laughs> but I've learned that they, you just have to shine your torch at them and lift your arms a little bit, and they will run away into the distance. But maybe they'll come back, which they actually did a few times that night. Yeah. Look, look at how many hyenas are here this morning. Oh, they've all just gone around the back. Looks like they're playing a game of tag. Tag, you're it. Oh, sweet. Sweet, where are you guys going? Oh, tag. <laughs> So I've just had an update that one of the females that are up and about here playing is, is named Pretty. Is, is, 
The one chasing the other one, that's right. Thank you, Nikki, in the control room with giving me some, some updates. So I've, I think it was Billy Joe and, and Nikki that are helping me out with my hyenas. And Kim, yes, thank you, Kim. Wow, I've been very lucky. Eh? Yesterday I'd watched hyenas playing, and today I've been watching hyenas playing. They've been, they've been very good to me while I've been here on my interviews. They really allowed me to relax. Uh, yesterday, just watching them play, I was, you know, quite nervous, as you as you could have told. And um, to have, ooh, have a look. He's right. Hello, Samuel. Pretty. Hello, Samuel. How are you? Welcome to Juma Game Reserve. My name's Pretty. I, I'm quite pretty. Oh, look how curious they are. That's sweet. Yo, she, that's a big belly, eh? Huh? Have a look at that belly there, Viam. Wow, pretty. Looks like she wants to have another cub. You know... It's, it's so incredible for me to have hyenas so close to, close to me. I've never had this before. I'm sure you viewers have seen this a few times, but for me, this is a, this is a first. Ontario, um, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, from what I understand, is uh, hyenas, you know, as they they become when they yes, the question was that they wanted to know, you know, what age do they actually start going out and, and hunt with their with their mothers and fathers, um, and it's and you know it's a it's a good question. You know, from what I understand, is that the the they will be living in the den for a, for a couple couple months, and when they feel that they're ready to take them out, they'll take them out. But but genuine, uh, generally, they and I, I suspect, you know, um, I would actually love for a for a viewer to to let me know if they know the exact date or the exact amount of time it takes for them to actually go out with with the with the parents. But um, I'm guessing it's just after just a few months, three to four. And um, and uh, before they start moving or out, outside of the den, um, but you can imagine it's very dangerous for a, for a youngster to to be leaving the den at a young age. And um, so that's that's what my guess would be. But if if you have any uh, any other answers for me, please tweet it in and, and help me learn. Um, as I said, um, if I do get this position here, I would love to learn with you and through you and and through the bush. It's uh, one big learning experience for all of us. Oh, sweet. Wow. So how was that, everyone? What an interesting, interesting morning here with our hyenas. They've really, really helped. Ooh, that smell, sheep is. I got a, quite a big whiff of that one there, but that smell is quite powerful. But it's been a really, really good morning. We've just been watching them play. If you, anyone has, uh, has just come online, they, we've been sitting with the hyenas, and they've been playing and running around, playing tag around the den. And yesterday, I was exceptionally, exceptionally lucky to, to be watching, watching them play in the water yesterday. So the rain has been very kind to us all lately. Marianne in Arkansas. 
has just told me that was it December 1 has a white foot. That's right. Uh, so, VM, do you reckon you can... Ooh, sorry, guys. I don't know if I spoke too loud there. It's going to soften it down a little bit, everyone. Can you, can you see where December 1 might be? Mm. Yeah, maybe still in the hall. Inside the den? Yeah. OK. A bit like these two. But thank you very much for that. I will, I will remember December 1 with a white foot at the back. December 1 with a white foot at the back. Sweet. Thank you so much, Linda. Linda Scrogan, who has just told me that they will start leaving the den at around six to eight months. I thank you so much. Really, I really am grateful for you letting me know that um, and, and just giving me some, some knowledge behind that. That's, that's great. It's so important that we can learn and, and, and learn more about the hyenas through, through the viewers. So, but on that note, I'm going to link through to Scott, and uh, we will be seeing you just now. Thank you so much. Bye. Well, ser seriously, sounds like Sam is having some great time with the hyena, not only today, but also yesterday. He had a fascinating sighting with Brian. We've got some good news. There are tracks of lion that appear to cross into Juma from our eastern boundary called Cheetah Cut Line. And they look like they're heading towards the bubbles of Watol. So we basically saw the tracks off to our right, to our east, coming towards us, in the westerly direction. And if we don't find their tracks or the animals popping out onto this road, then I'm guessing they're somewhere still in this thick block of vegetation. So I'll need to probably go in on foot. The tracks did seem quite fresh. I think they may have got up just after it started raining recently now. I saw where they had all been lying in the road and they may have run off that open road in order to try and get under some leaves for whatever sparse shelter that may assist with. Come on, where are the tracks? Where are the tracks? I was hoping they would have popped out by now. Hmm. Either way, good prospects. Very, very good prospects. Who knows, maybe there's even going to be one of the Birmingham males with them. A coalition of five big males reign dominant over this area. And it's been a long time since we've seen them. Come on, lions. I'm hoping that we're just going to find them lounging at the Buffalo Quarter Hall, which is just around one or two more corners. What I'm hoping is that they haven't just snuck through the northeastern corner of our property straight into our northern neighbors. There is a chance that they have done that, though, so I will forewarn you kind of the opposites of what they did when they were heading to Torchwood, where they've been for the last few days. They also snuck through our property, but in the opposite direction. Now, it can be deceptive, you, you would think is going to help soften the roads and yes it will but only certain roads certain substrates will become a lot softer for a certain time period that will receive tracks well and therefore make tracking easy whereas other substrates like the one we're driving on right now is rock hard so it's solidified and whatever fine film of dust there was on top of that initially before the rain is now no longer so some areas are hard some areas are easy 
but I'm confident that the Lions have not passed over this road. And just want to make sure they haven't kind of come through the bush to the water's edge. Wow, look at how much water's here. That is phenomenal. Cannot believe it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to waste too much time here, but a quick little pan of the water. Oh, look at how much water has filled up. That is great, great news. I'm not sure what it was like yesterday. I haven't been here since the rain we got two nights ago, but it's certainly a huge improvement. So that's great stuff. I can happily report that Sam and Viam are making their way into this general area to give us a hand with trying to track down the lions, so that's going to be useful. In this cool weather, the lions could well be on the move, and even though we've driven this road now, it may be useful for somebody to drive it again. Basically, what I'm doing now is I'm doing a complete circle around the block that these lions headed into. Or at least I hope they headed in. So I had a very quick look at the tracks, and some were certainly coming into Juma, but maybe they came in and then went back out around the next corner of the road. Anything is possible. I'm just hoping that they did come this way, or continue this way at least. Twitter, you would like to know how to tell the difference between a tortoise and a terrapin. Well, you'll never see tortoises uh, submerging themselves in water. Of course, if a terrapin is out the water, that may be a little bit more confusing. Um, their, their shells don't have patterns or coloration. They are a uniform dull gray color. So that would be one of the major things. They've got webbed feet for swimming, so if you are to open the foot of a terrapin, you would see the webbing, uh, whereas a tortoise doesn't have webbed feet. What else? I'm not too sure what other differences there could be. Maybe some of you guys can help out. Um, Terrapins have often got very cryptic colorations on their heads, interestingly enough. Not all terrapins, but some terrapins I've noticed. In terms of size, I mean, they can vary. You get big terrapins, small terrapins, big tortoises, small tortoises. I guess, again, as a general rule, though, the tortoises will be more rounded and terrapins will be flatter. They're not like a soccer ball chopped in half, terrapins. Um, although the Speaks Hingeback tortoise is quite a flat tortoise, so you do get a few flat tortoises. I think you even get a tortoise called a pancake tortoise. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I think that was up in East Africa. Unless I'm dreaming. Where are you, lions? Well, this is I'm driving quite quickly for a tracking exercise, and that's because I'm trying to make sure that they are not on the move and have not already crossed out of our property. So now this is our northern boundary. And what I'm probably going to do is just stop quickly. Oh no, I don't have my map to show you. I've given that to Sam so that he doesn't get lost. Um, but basically we are just checking the northeastern corner of the property. I could draw it in the sand quickly, I guess. Let me do that show you what's going on here. Let's put the camera on the right there so I know what my canvas looks like. Just on the ground. So I'm going to just draw on the sand. Cool. 
So, this is our eastern boundary, okay? This is our northern boundary. This is Buffalo's Hook Dam over here. There's a road over here, and basically the lines came in over here. We've just driven along a road that took us to the dam and past it, so the lines are somewhere in this triangle. And we are now gonna, we've checked from here along all the way here, now we're gonna continue from here and do a full circle, completely encompass this block to make sure the lines are still somewhere in the middle. Once we've established that, then we can go for a walk in the block. So hopefully that gives a better idea of what we're up to. Okay, one of you has just sent through a question wondering if lions can smell water, Cecilia. And yes, they certainly can. Um, they've got very, very good senses of smell and water will be something that they will be able to detect with their noses. Now, I'm preparing myself for the worst chair, and that is that these lions, we may find their tracks crossing here. Failing that, we are going to be lucky because if they haven't crossed out of here then they must be somewhere still on June. Oh, no. I think they've crossed. I've just seen some tracks here. Yeah. What is it of though? What are you? Look it's a tiny baby hippopotamus. These tracks I can see. Not a lion. So we may be st still be in luck. Should go on this side, right? Not easy to see. You can see a few faint depressions on the ground here to our right. Um, not easy because the vehicle's in the way, but I think those are from a baby hippopotamus, not in fact the lions. Let me just jump out and have a closer look. Make sure the lions aren't anywhere nearby. This is a tiny hippo, a miniature, miniature hippo. Now that I've got, can you see this one? I can. You can see one toe, two toe, three toe, four toe, and this is the back pad. So a minute little hippo, its mother's tracks are up ahead. Much larger, but not easy to see. Cute. So, let's hope the lions didn't come across that because I would certainly have tried to consume it. Okay. I would suggest that uh, VM and Sam, when they do get into this area, possibly to check Hippo Pools Road. Um, so that's something that Nikki can relate to them. keep in touch with uh, Taxon and Ephraim as well as they are also coming into this area to give us a hand. I'm just checking you guys copied my updates of the Zimkonzo heading uh, northwest into Juma over Cheetah Cut Line north of Pipeline. Probably well, I've uh, circled the block uh, along Hippo Pools Road, Buffalo Dam East. I think they are still in the block. So I'm going to go for a quick walk. Okay, so we're about to complete 
of this big circle that we've done around the block. I'll be able to show you the lion tracks. And from there, we're probably gonna get you guys back onto Sam's vehicle for a bit as I explore on foot, as that is the most effective way of trying to find big game on foot. To drive off-road, trying to follow their track would be near impossible, well, entirely impossible. It's hard enough whilst walking to see, to work out where they've gone. They may not be hugely inclined to move big distances and or feed because they did catch an adult female buffalo. So that was not yesterday, the day before, I think, or possibly the day before that, but basically they've been feeding on buffalo until probably some stage last night when they abandoned the carcass, as there would have been nothing left for them to snack on. I think Ephraim did go there, one of the guides who does have access to that property, and he says that there's only vultures there finishing off the scraps. some disturbance on the road yet. Hard to tell out is where a lion has slept. Um, the rest of them are sleeping further ahead of us. It's difficult to see from here, but I will be able to show you this kind of scuffle on the, on the ground here. And if you zoom in, Day, if you go back a bit, um, over there, there's a track. You can faintly see where my finger is that there are some toe marks of where a lion has stood, but it was before the rain. So I think they're somewhere not too far away from us in this block. tracks here all over the road these ones look fresher this looks to me like it could have been some of which after the rain um, if you take a look here Dave very clear lion tracks here so I'm gonna take a short walk into the block and try and work out where they've gone they have headed into Juma, it's not easy to see, but let me show you here. There's a few very faint paw marks. This is after the rain, sadly, but it is heading in to Juma. So I'm gonna continue on foot and see if we don't get lucky. I'm gonna take this little handheld radio so I can, I can be in comms with Dave. If I do get lucky, I might get him to drive the vehicle into the block if we do find them. So that, that, that's that. Sam is also going to be working the area. I've told him to check the road hippo pools that I have already checked. And we're going to send you across to him right now. See you later. Welcome back, everyone. Back to Sam and VM in the vehicle. We've just been with the hyena cubs, and that was fantastic. I had a great time down there and learned a, a new thing or two with some of the guests and viewers that have been with me. Um, it's been an incredible two days for me. Uh, I haven't slept much as I was quite tired, uh, thinking about all the sort of things that comes with guiding for the first time with a camera behind you. But it's been exceptionally exciting and 
uh, yeah, I thank you for, for allowing my nerves not to, to overtake my driving and all of that, so thanks. But here we sit just outside, I think it's Gowrie Cutline, and we were just sitting, uh, we were just sitting with some of the birds, a hornbill and a starling, and they've just left us, unfortunately, and I know Scott's now on tracks, the lion tracks, so we're gonna let him go out on the lion tracks, and I just wanna to do, to just experiment this thing one more time, if you guys are willing to participate with me on this experience. So we just saw a Cape Glossy Starling. So do we know the, the names of all the different starlings? Um, I know one is the Birchall's Starling, the Cape Glossy Starling, and the Greater Blue-Eared Starling. So that's the ones that I know. Let me know if there's any others. I don't think there are. Um, but it's we, we, eh? Isn't there a purple one or something? Oh uh, yes, there's, the, there's a purple one, eh? I know in Cape Town, where I live, we get the red wing starling. Violet backed. Thank you very much, Nikki, in the control room. Got my back. Um, so anyway, we're just going to quickly show you this device and see how it works. Uh, the starling. So we go to starling. Two hundred and seventy-six. Two hundred and seventy-six. Okay, so here are all our different starlings. As we said, the violet back starling, which I've actually seen before, so I should have known that, seen that. And then there's what we just saw was the Cape Glossy starling, the Greater Blue-Eared starling. Oh, we've got the Black-Bellied starling, uh, Meave starling, and the Birchels. All right, so. Can anyone tell me what sound that was? That was just the, the opening of the, uh, this device. There was a bird call there. If anyone can tweet in what they thought that was, please let me know. Um, otherwise, this is how this works. Go in, and we just saw the Cape Glossy Starling. So we just put it on like that. Incredible, eh? That you can literally just put this on the book and it's going to play a sound for us. So I know I said it again, I said it yesterday, but today, you know, I think it's a great device. It helps us to understand and learn a little bit more about these birds. And so I'm now going to pay attention to that, that bird call and see if we can find it again. All right, we're going to head off in this direction. Uh, while Scott's going to be looking for those tracks, we're going to see what we can find and see if we can help him. Let's get moving on the road, everyone. Jen in Minnesota just asked me what is my favorite animal to watch. Wow. My favorite animal to watch. I said yesterday that um, the black eagle in the Cedarburg Mountains just outside Cape Town has without a doubt been my favorite bird to watch just because, you know, in the Cedarburg, we have two main uh, predators there and that's the the black eagle and the Cape Leopard. And the Cape Leopard is half the size of the Savannah Leopard. So if you can imagine, if you've seen the Savannah Leopard, have a look and type in on Google or whatever, and have a look at the Cape Leopard. It's half the size of the Savannah Leopard, and it controls a much, much greater territory. And why I'm bringing the Cape Leopard into this conversation is because the black eagle and the Cape Leopard have in direct competition with each other because in that mountain range there's no other predator so you'll see when you're tracking a cape leopard on foot in the distance you'll start seeing um, a, a black eagle come down and dive bomb the, the leopard and that's an indication to where that leopard is so yeah so I've thoroughly enjoyed watching the black leopard thank you very much
Okay. Well, Natasha, you were asking what was my favorite bird, and that goes, that goes, without without a doubt, it's the it's the black eagle. It's just such a beautiful eagle that when you watch it flying high above the sky, you'll see. Okay, just hold on, everyone. Um, the where about am I? Left or right? Is it cheetah cut line? Left or right? This is cheetah cut line, everyone. So we're going to go left here. Once. This is the eastern boundary. And uh, once again, I don't know anywhere and don't know what I'm doing on this property. Um, so if you see me getting lost, or just let me know. Help me out if you feel like you need to. Um, but just going back, I also want to say, you know, each, you know, each and every bird has its own beauty and its own way of well, its own design of living and I'm I'm very fascinated by every single bird so to actually say that one bird is my favorite is would actually be a lie I'm I'm hugely intrigued by how each and every single bird is able to live on this beautiful planet and and experience life the way it does you know they've all adapted everything's adapted and molded to this planet much like much like we have um, so I enjoy all my birds but I must say, when I was when I was traveling uh, through Brazil and I saw Tucanos, I was in, amazed by the Tucanos. They're such beautiful with those big, big, bright beaks. It's incredible. And Sasha, what is your favorite bird? I'd love to know what yours is. Nancy and Jen B. Well done for figuring out that first bird call that was on that device. It was in fact the African fish eagle. Well done. I'm highly impressed. I have to hear the sound of that bird every single time I switch on that device. So I know pretty well what's, what is what. It looks like we're coming to Scotia. Is that right, Phil? Okay, I'm gonna go and find out from Scott where the... No, we're gonna go say hello to... Oh, it's just Dave. Scott's out tracking. Um, I'm gonna see and ask Dave where the best place I could go and look for tracks and see if I can help out with this exploration. But as you can tell, Scott's on foot at the moment. And so... And so I can't get out the vehicle and look with him. But I'm going to see if I can go somewhere on my vehicle. How's it going, Dave? Great, Dave. It's going all right? Yeah. Has yeah. he just gone down there? Foot, Did you guys come from down here? Yeah. Okay, we're going to head and see if we can find tracks. Oh. Sweet. That was Dave, everyone. So we've got VM behind my camera, and we've got Dave. So I've just got an update from Scott saying that the best thing I should do is go and carry on straight here and turn left into the block and then carry on left again and see if I can find some tracks and help him. Um, because I would love to find you guys either a leopard or a lion this morning. It would help me with my interview drive, I think, one or not, if I can help, help find a predator. So I actually need you guys to be my eyes as well. See if you can see anything in the, in the distance while I'm looking at you. South Carolina. I do believe that there's uh, limited beginner's luck and then that's exactly what I'm going to go and do now. I'm not sure of all the roads. I think I'm going to... 
of this one. Can I go down here? Uh, this is the fire break. This is the fire break. No, we can go down. Let's go down the fire break. So I'm going to do my best to find something. Let's see what we can do. You know what, to be honest, guys, I'm just excited to be out in the Savi Sands. I know if I did get the job, I'd have the opportunity to to learn more about the roads and where where the leopards are. I think most of our viewers know and understand where some of the leopards are and that sort of stuff. So I'm excited to begin to learn and understand the different territories, see what we have. California, your question was, what is the biggest difference between lion and leopard tracks? Firstly, a lion track is a lot bigger than a leopard track. So when you're walking and you're out tracking and you see a big, big track, it's going to most likely be a, a lion's. And you'll see at the back, I mean, I'm, let's see if I've got my book here. I'm going to quickly show you quick, quick. This is my book, Signs of the Wild, that I've had since uh, I started. It's been my best friend. Have a look here, guys. That's the leopard track over here. Okay. And that's, and this is the lion track. So what you'll notice is that the lion track is quite a lot bigger than the leopard track. And also, there's a definite, those, those definite marks over there. But you'll also see that in the lion, the lion also has big, like coming down here, We'll see it. We'll see it here as well. So, three lobes. That's the one. Thank you, Nikki. Three lobes. There's a good indication. So, it's much easier to find and and, and see tracks in the morning and the afternoon, where the sun is at a tilt, and you can see. So let's see if we can find one of those tracks. I think the road that I'm on now, what road are we on here? Um, the woodling is key. Hi, Natasha. Um, you, you said that your it's uh, the the finch and the robin, if that's correct. Those are two beautiful birds. Um, yeah, I know all birds are very beautiful, but those two in particular are very beautiful. And over here we have a woodlands kingfisher, much like the the kingfisher that we saw that we saw yesterday. We've seen quite a lot of the woodlands kingfisher. I actually once saw a woodlands kingfisher catch a small bat. Can you believe that? That was quite an interesting experience that I once had. But if you can just have a look at that design there of that kingfisher, they're so well designed for, for waterine areas to, to catch and snip things off the ground. Oh, there he goes. 
But uh, I was having a watch at uh, Scott's at Scott's one yesterday, and he was showing you how it had that core. It's such a beautiful core, eh? Hey? All right, so let's keep looking, guys. I'm going to see what we can find. The yeah, M's saying that I should go left, you know? Tammy in Seattle. Um, I didn't actually see any hummingbirds while I was in Brazil. Uh, the work that I was doing in Brazil was was to to do lectures in biomimicry at all the different universities, and um, and so I was going to Sao Paulo and Rio and Brasilia and doing talks on uh, on how we can learn from natural systems. If if I if you can just give me. Two seconds. Um. All right, so over here I've got a plant, if you can see. And biomimicry, just to explain, I was telling quite a few people what it was yesterday, but it's something that, you know, I really need the genius of the natural world to help me with. and. Biomimicry is essentially learning from natural shapes and designs. And um, in Brazil, this is what I was doing. So I never got to see the hummingbird, but I was doing lectures in biomimicry, learning about and teaching people how we could learn from the design of the natural world. You can see just from this leaf how it can capture water over there and send water down its, into the stem and down the water to its leaf. And, you know, how is this capturing sunlight? If you think about our solar panels, think about your solar panels on your roofs. They're all standing at like a, at a horizontal degree like this. And what if we actually had solar panels that could move with the sunlight? So biomimicry is about exploring and understanding the way in which nature adapts to its changing conditions and allows us to become more efficient in our own lives. So that's just an explanation. A quick explanation of biomimicry. I hope that helps you understand it a little bit better. Um, but I, I was also very privileged to, to go down the Amazon River. And while I was on the Amazon River, I was learning and seeing many, many different types of other birds. And I was exceptionally lucky. And I must say, if I have a, if I have a favorite bird from Brazil, it would have been the, the macaw, the blue macaw. Um, have a look at the blue macaw. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rio. Uh, that, that main character bird is actually called the blue macaw, and it's just such a beautiful bird. It flies around gregariously around the, around the rivers, of, uh, mainly in the Pantanal. You mainly find it around the Pantanal. So I was very privileged to see that. Thanks again for being in safari. Um, I'm going to be back just now. Uh, I see Scott's just come off his vehicle. Let's find out what Scott has been seeing on his walk. Cheers for now. So my little walk did not provide us with any further information, sadly. It appears like, on closer inspection, that rain has fallen after these lions have moved, therefore kind of washing away their tracks, making it hard to follow them. But Texan said he seemed to think he had some tracks that did cross over Hippo Pools Road, which is a road that I did check and didn't see any tracks crossing. So, um, it's good news, still good prospects. It's, it seems like these lions have headed deeper into Juma as opposed to away from us. Yeah. We could get lucky. There looks to be 
see some large tracks of the Birmingham males alongside the smaller lioness tracks. So that's what's getting me really excited. I know a lot of you will be over the moon if we get to see the Birmingham boys again. It's been sure, a very, very long time. I think possibly even last year. No, hang on. Is that even possible? I think it is possible. I think last year may have been the last sightings of the Birmingham males. I think that could have even been with me. Following, was it Scrapper? One male, I think it was Scrapper, following one male around. He was pacing backwards and forwards, trying to work something out. We never got to the bottom of it, but. That was a long while ago on the 24th of December. So, my lapel had, which is this little microphone uh, that you can probably now hear me talking through, but couldn't before. It's fallen off my shirt and down to my belly button. It would have been of no assistance to you guys hearing me. But I think we're back on track now. Safari Dean, you are interested to know when or how long will it take for some fish to repopulate the water holes? Um, sure. I think, I think, I don't know. It's, it's a very, very good question. I mean, there could well be some catfish that have got themselves into a safe position below the mud in a mucous membrane where that they can breathe through. They don't need to breathe through gills like regular fish, the catfish. So they have the ability of kind of lying dormant, waiting for better times, which have arrived now. There's water in the buffalo. What's also, will they squirm out of the mud and make the most of what little water's there and then re-squirm themselves back into the mud when it dries out? I'm not too sure. Um, I think we're just going to have to keep an eye on the birds that feed on fish and when they start frequenting the, the water holes again, I think that will be an indication that the fish are becoming more active again. But I don't think it's going to be any time soon. I think the fish may know to wait for better times. But I've never been through a drought before, so there's a lot that we are all going to learn in the coming months, including myself. The last drought in this area was in 2002. I was still at high school back then. So my lack of knowledge of a drought is not going to put me in a good position to answer that question accurately. in Iowa, you have asked a very, very, very good question and one that I'm having to think long and hard about. You've noticed that over time, uh, watching the, the various water hole cameras that Wild Earth have, that you've never seen porcupine, aardvark or pangolin ever drinking at them and therefore are they not water dependents? And I guess, I guess maybe not, no. Um, I've never seen any, any of those three animals drinking myself. An animal like a porcupine will, I think, be able to acquire a lot of moisture from the roots and bulbs and bark that it feeds on. Aardvark, I can't even imagine what it looks like when it drinks because it's got such a bizarre mouth. Check this out. Um, Let's get it in the book. How 
What do you drink out of a mouth like that? Hmm. Interesting beast. So, it doesn't say anything in this book about drinking. Um, I'm sure there are other books that will provide us with better information and more information on them. Thanks, Dave. Um, but no, I guess, I guess the fact that after all the time that the waterhole cameras have been up at Juma during especially the dry months now, like the drought we've been experiencing and in the winter months, if you've never seen a porcupine, aardvark or pangolin coming to any of the various waterhole cameras that we have, it would be a good indicator that they're not heavily water-reliant. That's not to say, though, that they don't have the odd drink when uh, the opportunity uh, avails itself to them, but I don't think they will go out of their way to do it. Otherwise, naturally, you'd think you guys would have spotted some more on the what's all cameras. Good question, PK. And one that we may need to do a little bit more research on when back at camp and have access to bigger books with more information. It definitely has got the brain ticking. So thank you for that. <laughs> James Richards, thank you for confirming that it was in fact Scrapper the day before Christmas. Running around, you said possibly he was in a panic because he had some last minute shopping to do for all the Lioness. And I think that's spot on looking back on it. <laughs> Are you lions come on we're all so excited to see you Sam is still in the general area so who knows hopefully he will get lucky I would love to see the smile on his face if he does manage to find all these lion shame we haven't managed to show him any big cats and he is heading out today after this drive so it would be a great pity if he doesn't see any but at the rate he's going I'm hoping he is gonna be coming back here in the near future and getting settled in but only time will tell it sounds like he's found an animal that we'd like to show you, one that we have been discussing earlier. So go on and check it out for yourself. Welcome back, everyone. Over here, we have the sweetest little terrapin. Look at him, he's so little. He's so cute, eh? There really has just been an abundance of terrapins. There's actually another one over here. Vim, can you show that one as well, please? What, the one to the right? The one just to the left. Oh. You see him? Over there. Oh, there we go. So they're youngsters. So this is, this is a very difficult time for these little terrapins. They're the early, early ages of their lives. and. You know, any predator, such as an owl or, or an eagle, can come and easily take one of these little guys. And so I'm hoping they're going to find some cover soon. But how sweet are they? Hey? Wow. Very, very cute. Patrick, here's my hat. I'm wearing my hat right now. <laughs> what happened was the rain, the rain was a bit uh, wet this morning, so I decided to put it, to put it on only a little bit later and actually just drive in the rain. Sometimes I like just having my hat off, getting the rain in my face and experiencing the bush. Um, but I'm told that uh, a lot of you guys thought that there was a smiley, smiley face on my hat. Is this, is this what you think? This a little smiley face. <laughs> do you want to give this? Uh, do you want to give the smiley face a name, or we just want to say maybe the side of Sam's head face? 
I don't know. Let me know if it gets distracting. I totally understand if it does get distracting, but you have to understand that this is a hat that has brought me many, many memories and much luck over my past. Think of all the little things that you have that have took, taken you through your experiences in life. And I must say, if it's two things that I love the most, it's this hat and, and these shoes. These are my fellies, which I've had for two years. So I cherish my things. So thank you very much. I'm going to put it back on. I can actually see that smiley face now. He's smiling back at you. Or actually, maybe I should give him a little bit more of a smile. There we, there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, little Terrapins. Have a beautiful day. Look after yourself, and we'll see you a bit later. We are off to find some lions. Look at all this water. I just want to show you guys this water. This water is going to bring a lot to Juve. It's going to bring a lot of the, the herbivores back into the area, which will bring what? What will the herbivores bring? Lots and lots of other predators. So I'm going to keep my eye out. Kathy in Tennessee and Joyce from Pennsylvania. Um, I saw, hold on, I don't want to drive over a terrapin. There's, look, look at the little one over here. You see him again? No, you see his head, his head's popping out there. Anyway, you gotta be very careful. I don't want to drive over terrapins, so I'm just trying to be, careful as I can be. Oh, there's one right here. See. Right, we're going to look after our beautiful animals on this beautiful reserve. Um, just to going back to that question, um, so a little, the question was, you know, where, where am I from and where did I learn to guide and a little bit of my story. Um, so in 2013, uh, well in 2013 I did my, uh, my, my honors and masters studying in ecological design and understanding sustainability. And, um, and I was learning about the genius of the natural world. And in a book, I was learning a lot about how we can learn designs from the natural world and apply them to human systems to make our systems a little bit more efficient. Um, and it just felt very, like, it didn't make sense to me that I wasn't actually experiencing any of the natural world. And that's when I decided to become a guide. That was just three years ago. And, um, and from there, I went straight to London Lozi Game Reserve, just about maybe 10, 15 kilometers south from here. And that's where I did all my training, where I, I walked into my first lions and my first cheetah um, and got trained up as a game ranger. Um, and from there, um, I left the bush. So I actually haven't been back here for about a year. So eight months of training in the bush. So I still have so much to learn here in the Sabi Sands. And that's why I'm very excited. If I get this opportunity, I get to learn with you and through you back in this ecosystem. But, but from there, I went off to, to the top of Cape Town to the Cedarburg Mountains. And I ooh, just want to get through this hole.
And I went off to the Cedarburg Mountains and I went and looked and tracked for Cape Leopards um, and worked with children. You can actually find a link on YouTube. If you have a look on YouTube, type Sam Shev Cedarburg and you'll see a little clip that I did. I used to do environmental education up in the north there, teaching kids the importance of biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity for their social well-being. And, and how it is good for our minds and how it's good for our bodies to be with the natural world. So that's what I was doing there. And then from there, I went off to England and I did a further masters. And, um, and that's when I got the opportunity to go and work and live in Brazil. Uh, my girlfriend was in Brazil at the time and traveled many places, went to the Pantanal, saw Jaguar, saw Puma, saw many different birds. So I'm still coming back from many, many different ecosystems, you know, the Pantanal, the Cedarburg, the Savannah, um, and now I'm back here. So that's my a very quick and brief history of Sam Chevalier. And yes, I also forgot to mention that I have a twin brother, and his name is Thomas, and he is my best friend in the whole world. And I miss him all the time. James Richard, you are quite excited to see an African land snail. I would love to see one myself. I would absolutely love one. Ooh, we're going into quite a dip here. Guys, if you've noticed, the water has just been outrageous. So I'm going to do my best to find an African land snail. See if we can find one. But you know, just to go back, if you have a look, can we just have a look at these clouds, VM? I don't know if you guys can get a good look at this. I'm sure this will be a nice thing for a lot of the viewers to see as the clouds are forming, and this is a great sign for the savannah and the Sabi sands, as it's gonna bring a lot of rain to this area. As I said earlier, rain brings us the herbivores and brings us the predators. And so it's very important. So look, I'm in a jacket. I'm in a rain jacket, which means that there's going to be more rain, hopefully. Tell you what, the elephants and the bu buffaloes are going to love these little watering holes. Shamrock. Um, you know, my the question was it was a long question based on you know I have an interest in ecological intelligence and adaptations, um, and that's correct. You know, I'm very fascinated by how things adapt to their environments and you know how how everything evolved into such a space. And it's always been an interest of mine, and, and you know specifically in the fields of ecology. You know, how does, how does the system work? How does, you know, how do plants and trees and birds and predators all live together in an ecosystem that creates the outcome it does? So, you know, that's very much a systems thinking approach. And I've been trying to, to learn more about, you know, the influence of a predator on an ecosystem and how that allows to create more biodiversity. So just like I was speaking a little bit earlier with the Cape Leopard, that Cape Leopard in the Cedarburg Mountains allows for a number of species to exist because of the Cape Leopard. 
Why? It's because the Cape leopard regulates the organisms that eat too much of the plant species, the herbivores. So if you start to understand that, then you start to see that the predator is incremental and a very, very important part of an ecosystem. And as soon as you start losing those predators, then you start, you begin to lose the ecosystem itself. So this is a very, very important thing to understand. And for me at least to understand is, is because sometimes we don't create the connection between sociology, the, the interaction of humans and, and the ecology and how they are, not, are they separated. We often study things in separation. Um, I found that school did that for me. Um, you know, I went and learned about geography, I learned about lands, landscapes and geology, the types of rocks and types of rainfall and all that sort of stuff. And then I went into my biology class and I started studying the, the intricate parts of a leopard and a frog and I started to, op you know, we would open up frogs to have a look at and see their anatomy and that sort of stuff. Um, and. You know, that was a very kind of a machine approach, I believe, to, to understanding nature, uh, because we didn't really see the connection between the leopard and the landscape. What is the connection between the leopard and the landscape? And, and what is that dynamic? What is that relationship? And um, I think sometimes that we overlook the little things and, and we don't see the relationships. We just look at things in parts. So yes, to answer that question, I think, I'm super interested in evolutionary biology, understanding how we can learn from the natural world and to see what our place is as the human species so that we don't have to decimate everything that we do in the cities. How do we begin to grow the ecology of the outdoors into the ecology of our cities? Because they are intricately connected. Okay guys, we're going to link back to Scott for an update. I'm going to do my best now to see if I can find an animal, a herbivore, maybe a zebra or giraffe, or hopefully a predator. Get back to you now. See you later. So, no joy yet. I'm thinking of doing another short walk into the block where Taxon apparently saw some tracks of these lion. Um, but it's, it's tricky business because a lot of the evidence has been washed away by the rain. So until they move again, and need, they're not, you know, it's going to be hard for us to follow their tracks. That is the problem we're facing. And to walk around, obviously it increases our chances greatly of finding them in any one of these blocks, but I fear that they could have possibly crossed over a couple of roads without us actually knowing about it, because like I said, the evidence has been washed clean. So I'm having the debate now as to, is it a waste of time to walk around hoping to come across them without being able to actually follow any tracks, without even knowing where their tracks have gone? Um, Let's see if we can get off that bird quickly, it's a gamble. Uh, there, off it goes. There's a battalion eagle there. And it seems to have something trailing behind its feet. Not easy to see from that angle we got there. But I think it may have had a small piece of meat. Who knows, maybe that was carrying back to a nest site. Hard to be certain. Nate in Nevada. Haven't heard you before, so thanks for getting in touch with us. And 
You're interested to know whether I think the grass will start growing from the small amounts of rain that we've received or will it require more rain? It certainly will grow from the small amounts of rain we've re recently received. It's just a matter of how long will it be able to grow for? How long will that moisture be able to sustain growth? But definitely, um, it will be even worth just taking a look at these. Well, it's tricky because you know a lot of the vegetation is being fed on. But these little green shoots off to our right here will become bigger. But at what rate they get feed, fed on will obviously have a direct impact on how much it may appear like it is growing. But there's definitely going to be a surge of growth. We've got a decent amount of rain now. It's certainly going to help. But for how long is the question. Matt in Michigan also on the topic of the weather and the rain, although you're interested to know what may happen in the winter. Are there speculations that we're going to have a different weather pattern during our normally dry winter? And yes, there certainly is a possibility of that. The El Nino weather effect, which is impacting on the weather we're experiencing here, does often do that. It creates complete reversals of typical weather patterns. So you'll find areas that are supposed to be dry are wet and places that are supposed to be wet are dry at the various times of the year or at the wrong times of the year. So that certainly is possible. The effects of that will be interesting. We did discuss it briefly the other day. Obviously rain will help growth. Our winters are fairly mild. I mean it's not like it's blisteringly cold and it's not the right climate for vegetation to grow. It certainly can grow through the winter months if there is moisture. And, oh, this is a pleasant surprise. A large spider. So yes, it'll be interesting to see. The only thing that's gonna have an impact on the growth is the fact that there's not gonna be as much daylight hours as during the summer months. Okay, so what we have here is a golden orb web spider. The female is on the right, ginormous. The male is on the left, looks like. Is that one male and then different spiders next to it or those other males next to it? I can't really see, let me get my binoculars on. So there's two other even smaller spiders which were to the left of the male. And I think those are in fact different. Those could be kleptoparasites that steal the hard-earned food of the golden orbweb spider. The male is on the different side of the web. You can see, we can see his back, whereas we can see her stomach. And that indicates that he is scared of her. He's staying on the other side of the web because there is a chance that post-mating, she may decide to eat him. So, or even before mating. She may see him as a food source. So that's why he's hanging around on the opposite side of the web. It is a large spider. It's going to be difficult for me to show you a size indication, but if I put that spider on my palm, its legs would basically occupy a lot of space on my hand. It looks like she is missing a leg or two. Arachnids. I should have eight legs, and she only has six. Sorry, so this is not a good example of, this is an arachnid in insect disguise. Unless my abacus is faulty, yeah, she only has six legs, so she's obviously been in the wars. Usually, in a typical summer, we'll have many, many golden orb-web spiders, but during this drought, there have been not nearly 
as many that we've seen. Cool. She's having fun in the in the wind, dancing about. I just spotted another web here. Let's see if there's not another one in it. It looks abandoned though. It's just off to our right here. I can see a few little twigs stuck in it. The webbing is what causes their name, and now with the better lighting, you can see it does have a golden tinge to it, hence the name golden orb web spider. There's also golden coloration on their bodies, but it's mainly because of their webbing, and that webbing is incredibly, incredibly strong. Small birds can get tangled in it if they're not careful. Okay. Ephraim has just got a hold of Texan on the radio, and he says, Upinyamazan, meaning, where are the animals? So, <laughs> it appears like <laughs> uh, Ephraim replied to Upinyamazan to his Texan's response was, Zonke in a fambile, meaning all of them, Zonke. And a fambile, to fambile is to, to leave. So that's a good indicator that not only us are battling to find mammals, the reptiles have been good, and I guess that arachnid was a pleasant surprise. But the mammals are hiding. you would like to know what sense does it make for a female spider to consume a male? Well, I guess he's done his job. She can do with an extra meal to help further nourish the eggs that will be developing within her abdomen before laying them. That would be... You know, it kind of does make sense. The males uh, and the females will die at the end of every season. They only live for one summer. And therefore, once a male has performed its role on the planet, and its role solely being to fertilize the female, well then, why not consume him? It kind of does make sense. She too is also gonna die, but she does need that extra little bit of energy and nourishment to go towards raising or nurturing those eggs that will be developing. So it does make sense. They only live for a season, and I guess that will help solidify that theory. Ben in Indiana and great to have you with us. Just a little thing to start off with uh, that I'd like to correct you on. It's something that I too was corrected on and I think it's a mistake that is so commonly made that we need to just keep spreading the word and that is that no spiders or snakes are poisonous. They are all venomous. Poison is ingested into your stomach and then makes you sick. Venom is injected into you via a bite, also making you sick, but different, two different things. Um, so no, we don't have poisonous spiders here, but yes, we do have venomous ones. The violin spider and sack spider are two of the most venomous spiders that you get in our area of operation. I thankfully have never been bitten by one. You say you get the brown recluse over where you live. I think they also occur here in South Africa, to be honest. I think they've been transported, whether on purpose or not, they are here as well. But yes, out of all my time in the bush, I've had no spider bites. Interestingly though, when I was young, a young kid living in the city, I had a bite on my upper thigh, and I remember it was a perfect column of 
flesh that was destroyed in my leg and I could fit an earbud, the whole head of an earbud, like the thing, you know, the soft cottony part of an earbud into that hole. Ugh. Horrible sight of toxic venom. I think I've still actually got the scar, but it would require quite a risque show for, in order for me to show it to you, so not today. Maybe on the late night show. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, there is a late night show that we kind of do whatever, whatever we like, worth tuning into. I'm, I'm only kidding. Everything is kept clean on our safaris. Texas, you said you've never seen spiders occupying the same web, and it is quite interesting. Often males will lurk close to the females, they just go unnoticed because they're often far, far smaller. In the case of that golden orb web spider, possibly a 20th of the size, a 50th of the size, I mean it's minute compared to the female. On top of the male and the female golden orb web spiders, you also get what are called dewdrop spiders. And I think those could have been the even smaller ones that we saw, but I couldn't be certain. They've got a tiny little, little silver bottom, which uh, gives them their name, a dewdrop spider. It looks like a little drop of water. And those are kleptoparasites. So they will, because they're so small, they almost go unnoticed by the golden orbweb spider. And she will uh, be feeding on uh, her, her kills that she successfully made and wrapped up. And they'll come in also while she's not there and suck on the hemolymph, the bodily fluids from that. So they'll just be stealing from her and just living on her web because that's where the food is going to be. You do also, Marjorie, get community nest spiders and I'm sure we'll be able to find you one by the end of the drive. It'll obviously need to be close enough to the road that the camera can get uh, zoomed in on it. But those are basically spiders living in a gigantic apartment block or block of flats, you could say. They're all in the same structure and they all uh, live communally together. I'm not sure how they split the jobs and work between one another, how they share the roles and responsibilities, but they somehow work it out. I'm sure there's a little bit of politics here and there, a few unhappy customers from time to time, or tenants within that apartment block, but they do seem to make ends meet. They live in funny clusters of webbing, like a big ball of, of web that we'll try and show you guys. So, I think I'm going to take a very short walk in here. Um, for lack of better ideas, we've driven around the area. The lions aren't close to the road that we have established, so maybe a short walk will reveal them sleeping nearby. So I'm going to do that, and while we do that, we are going to be sending you back to Sam, who has found a graveyard. Enjoy. Welcome back, everyone. As you would have just seen there, that things are looking fairly ominous out there. The rain is definitely coming upon us in a matter of minutes, a matter of t time before it starts raining upon us which is great. As we said earlier, it's good for the animals, it's good for everything else here, the plants, nourishment, and um, yeah, I'm sure, I know it cuts down your time of watching live safari, but it gives a lot more life to the bush that you'll be able to see in the future. As you see, I'm holding a jawbone, if you can see that. Yeah, and I want you, or well, you can see behind us, I was gonna ask you what jawbone do you think this is? Um, but that, but that uh, skull behind you should be able to tell you what skull bone that is. Please can you tweet in, hashtag Safari Live Sam, this is what I think that is. Um, but I think it's fairly, it's fairly obvious to, to what that might be. But uh, it's just great you know, to, you know, as being my first time here driving around um, Juma, it's great to, to learn more about the property and see what has already happened. You know, this land holds a memory, it holds an experience that I'm still coming to learn. And over here we have a kill site and it's incredible to see how things um, can just 
leap be left here and everything will be eaten. You know, the vultures will finish everything. Every, every single part of that bone will be cleaned up. Um, I, know that, I think that this is quite a few years old though, to be honest. But it's, it's great to see how things are left. And you know, all sorts of animals will still feed on this, you know, from bacteria to, to the different, um, you know, hyenas, as we saw a bit earlier, who like to eat bones. And they can crack into any bone with those strong, strong jaws of theirs. But have a look at these molars. Can you have a look at those molars? Can you get a good shot of that, Viam? Look at those, those molars are there to chew grass. They chew grass, they're just grinding at the back of their, their mouth. So that should also give you a little bit more of a clue to what we have on the ground here. All right, so I don't know if anyone knows. Once you know, please come and let me know what you think it is. Um, it's someone in the bush felt that likes to, to wear a crown on their head. And to be honest, is very, very scary on foot. Um, so I wouldn't recommend coming across them. Always important to clean your hands after picking up bones. May I just say that? If, I don't know if you have bones in your backyard, but uh, if you're any youngsters out there that see a bone and saw me picking up a bone, please just take care in washing your hands and eating safely at the dinner table. All right, guys, that was a fun little experiment to see what that was. I'm looking forward to hearing who knows the answer to the animal that is below us. Just gonna hook in. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. Great comments from everyone. Um, we got two answers. Deborah nearly got it with the dwarf mongoose. <laughs> Obviously, it's not a dwarf mongoose. It is, in fact, a Cape buffalo. We had another answer from Ava, who said that it might be a water buffalo. Ooh, have, you look, have a look at that bird in flight there. Can you see? Look at it just gliding. Let me try and get a better position. Are you guys able to see that? Is that visible, Nix? Yeah. Wow. Guys, I thought I would just show you the tightrope walker, the batelier flying in the sky above us. That is a very, very well-known bird in flight as it goes like this in the sky and it looks like it's tight roping. So that was a great little, little experience. But yeah, so what we saw over there was the Cape Buffalo, not the water buffalo. And I think I'll send it back to the viewers just one more time. What do you think is the difference between a Cape Buffalo and a water buffalo? Let me know. Hashtag Safari Live. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You hear that? I heard something in this drainage basin that sounded like a Franklin, that's correct.
then just asked, you know, some some birds have anthrax. That was correct, and I think Jamie had a conversation. Oh, some bones contain anthrax, and uh, I think yourself and Jamie might have had that conversation. I actually have no idea. Um, I didn't even know that some bones contained anthrax, um, so I'm not too sure. I'd love to find out and see and see what that what that answer is, Ben. I'll ask Jamie when I when I do get the opportunity to meet her. I've heard only good things about about Jamie. And that's another thing. I just want to say that I've thoroughly enjoyed being here and being in the camp, with it, whether it's from the, the presenters to the cameramen to um, just to the whole vibe of the camp. It's been such an incredible experience. They've all been very, very good to me while I've been here. Um, and so I'm thankful to everyone. Michelle in Michigan, um, Michigan, sorry. Uh, yes, so an eagle will catch a mouse and it will bring it, bring it back to a nest for its, its children to feed on. That is, that's exactly what I actually saw when I was out in the Cedarburg Mountains. Um, I actually, what, what the black eagle used to eat was a dussy. Does anyone know what a dussy is? Let me see if I can get you a quick picture of the dussy. I know it's right at the back here somewhere. Uh, Dussy 120. All right, so that's the Dussy over there. And that is very, like, you will often see dussies in the Cedarberg Mountains as well as many other baboons. And I once watched a dussy being killed by a black eagle and it was taken to the nests that were far, in the, far up in the cliffs of the Cedarberg Mountains. I used my binoculars to see it all go down. So that is the rock dussy. Also heavily preyed on by the Cape Leopard of the Cedarberg Mountains. Then we've got an impala. As I'm, I'm sure Scott or James or any of those presenters would have told you is that there's a lot of different indications that the bush will tell you in terms of if there are any predators around. If there was a predator around, all of a sudden you'd, you'd see that the, the buck wouldn't run away um, unless it was wild dogs. If you saw wild dogs, wild dogs would, this antelope would no longer want to be here. It would be running. But with a predator such as a leopard or a lion, it often turns towards the predator and looks at it and starts barking at the predator to say that I can see you, you are in my view. And often what the leopard will do is actually say, okay, I've been seen, and it'll lift up its tail that has a little white spot at the end of the tail, and that will tell uh, the predator, will tell the antelope that it surrenders, basically. I'm not going to try and, and catch you. But it didn't seem like that these antelopes were doing that. It just seemed like two males that were playing with each other. It's actually coming towards the rutting season. The rutting season is around May with the impala, and this is when the males come together, and they, or the, not the males come together, they split out of their bachelor herds, and they go and get harems of females of the, of the impala. You'll often see two males just fighting. Uh, during the rutting season while they're trying to be dominant over their harems of females. I'm looking forward to that. I hope I get to experience some impala rutting in May with you if I manage to get through this interview. But we'll see. We'll have to see.
Lucy in Indiana, thank you so much for coming to, to tell us what exactly the difference was of the Cape and the water buffalo. The water buffalo is most often well, is seen in, in India and buffalo, Cape buffalo is seen in Africa. Um, you get a number of uh, differences with, within the appearance of them and you can actually have a look. If you look up them you'll probably see that the Cape buffalo is a little bit bigger than the Indian. But uh, we'll have don't count on my word for that. Have a look and see what the difference between the Cape and the water buffalo is and get to know it a little bit better. But thank you so much for answering that question. It's great when viewers get involved and they ask questions and they answer them. It makes this job way more exciting for me. Well, this interview, <laughs> a little bit more exciting for me. I know that I'm engaging with We got a request from Easy in Long Island to see if we can see a European bee eater. We saw a European bee eater yesterday. We were very lucky. Yesterday, is if, if anyone was watching, oh, there goes a raptor of sorts. Um, yesterday, we would have, you would have seen that the termites came out and a lot of the birds were feeding on all the termites around the Sabi Sands. And there was all sorts of bird parties happening. The carmine bee eater bee is wild, as well as the European bee eater. And so the European bee eater, which um, I'm going to show you quickly, is this one over here. anyone else is out there is interested to learn more about what a bee eater is and, and what are the different ones that we have here, there is the European bee eater. This is the one that we saw yesterday, which is the carmine bee eater. And it was beautiful. There was a, a young juvenile that was had a very red chest, um, which was really nice to see. But the bee eater has a very, very significant sound that you can really hear. So I'm going to play it for us very quickly so that we can just quickly become accustomed to that sound of the bee eater so that I can find you a bee eater. closes with the sound of the Franklin. I just wish it wouldn't do that all the time. But that is the sound of a European bee eater. And we are now have that. I have that and I'm gonna set the intention of finding a European bee eater. So Scott is back on the vehicle. Unfortunately, he was not able to find anything, but he is going to give you an update. All the best and see you just now. So no joy. It was more of a march I did through the wilderness than a tracking exercise. I was just hoping to literally bump into the lions in an area where we could not see them from the road. And I probably covered about half a mile while you were gone. Um, 
Obviously, as quickly as I wanted to cover ground, you also need to be cautious while moving through the bush, and moving too quickly can be dangerous. So I was moving as fast as I thought safe, but didn't have any joy bumping into our furry friends. Who knows where they could be hiding? That is the problem, is that the area that they've been moving in, there's a number of quite hard roads regarding the substrates. Um, so, so I'm told you can't share me very well. So we put the lapel mic a little bit higher up. There we go. Um, so quite a few hard roads that these lines, or the general area that the lines have been moving through, which means they may have passed over some of the roads without us actually being able to see their tracks. That coupled with the fact that there has been rain that has washed away whatever evidence was there. Either way, good prospects, at least we think the lions are on Juma. So even if we don't find them this morning, maybe something will change for this afternoon. And from the few tracks that I did see on Cheetah Cut Line, which was a road with very easy substrates, it looks like there were some big males amongst them. I'm going to kind of extend the search a little bit further now. But first, I don't know if I'm stopped in the right place. There's a mother with a baby there. I think it might work from this angle. Some kudu lying down in this very kind of open area, and they're incredibly well camouflaged. The one that I want you to see, though, I think I'm going to need to roll forward for this is an adult female that we can see, but there's another female with a youngster that's just a little bit further ahead. We will get a little gap through here. Cute. Mom is chewing the cud. Watch closely. She's just swallowed a ball, and another one's going to come up her throat. Watch very close. Oh, dooms. Did you all see that? It's one of my most awesome things to watch. Usually with giraffe, though. But let's watch again now. Oh, there's an oxpecker sleeping on the kudu. Keeping warm, also getting some meals. Juvenile oxpecker doesn't have the bright red bull that it will get when it's an adult. OK, watch the kudu. She's about to swallow a mouthful of regurgitated cud. There's the adult oxpecker with its bright red beak. So watch closely. Like I say, she's going to swallow this ball soon. You'll see a distinct swallowing motion. Looks like she may be getting some mascara applied there or taken off by the oxpecker. OK, she's about to swallow. There we go, swallow. Now watch closely. The next bolus is on its way up. Badooms. Up. With giraffe, it's awesome because they've got such a long neck. But this is a good example of an animal that ruminates, chews the cud, just like a cow. There are many f animals with four chambered stomachs that will regurgitate. Oh, wasn't that rude? The oxpecker is interfering with her morning as she's minding her own business, chewing the cud and getting pecked in the eye. Although the oxpecker is trying its best to relieve the kudu of parasites. And there are a lot of flies out. Again, no surprise, after the rain that we've been receiving, the insect numbers are going to increase greatly. Here comes the next bolus of cud. Whoops, that wasn't an easy one to see. Oh, it looks like the baby's getting involved in some cud chewing as well. It had po popped its head down. I thought it was fast asleep there once it had had an eyeball or just checked us out. It then flattened itself to the ground. Look at mom now, she's doing a similar thing. She's also putting her head very low to the ground. Well, they're certainly going to be enjoying this cool weather, along with the injection of moisture that this little bit of rainfall we've had would, would have had an effect on the plants. They definitely would have soaked up as much moisture as possible, thus making them tastier for the herbivores. Well, I'm happy that I have managed to show you at least a mammal this morning. This is the first mammal. Sam's uh, 
one up on me now. He's got hyena and impala. I've got kudu. <laughs> Taxon and Ephraim have got nothing. By the sounds of things. Hi, Patricia. You've put forward a good theory suggesting that the animals are all a bit sleepy now because they didn't get much sleep during the rain last night. Yes and no. Your theory is good, but it didn't rain the whole night. It was actually dry when I walked out onto my veranda this morning. So the rain started about 10 minutes before we went live when Nikki and I drove to work in an open vehicle from Ingus House, which is where some of us stay, across to the DRC where the rest of the crew stay. It was dry, but the wind was howling. And Patricia, the wind, the strong wind would have kept the herbivores up or the prey animals up because they would have been terrified that there are, or that there were predators sneaking up on them with the cover of darkness as well as the cover of the noise being made by the wind as well as all the motion of the plants making it easier for them to creep up. So the herbivores would have had a terrifying night last night. I'm not too sure how windy it was throughout the course of the night, but when I woke up this morning, it was howling. like the rain has brought out some flowers, one of which Sam has found for you, so enjoy. Welcome back everyone to Safari Live. As we know that this is a live safari and we have just come to some beautiful looking morning glories. And yesterday we had a question uh, or a query to say, in this shroud, have we lost a lot of flowers? Have we not seen a lot? And correct, that was from Diane. Thank you, Diane, for coming and asking that, us that. These are called morning glories, a beautiful purple flower that comes out in the summertime. Beautiful. You can see some more here. It is great and it's fantastic to wake up in the morning when you start seeing a little bit more color. You know, I think just over the last few days, of course, I haven't been here for, for this whole year or maybe the whole year bef before this. Um, so I don't know how the drought's been. So most of you guys will know how bad this drought has really been. So for sure to see a beautiful morning glory is great for some of you. And um, it's great for me as I haven't seen a morning glory for a very long time. But as you can see, have a look here, the rain is coming along. Um, we're starting to feel a few more drizzles as the morning proceeds. We haven't been very lucky on seeing any um, games such as zebra, giraffe, um, or lion or leopard. But uh, this is the name of the game. This is the way it works. It's a live safari. Anything could happen at any moment. I might just drive down this hill and see an elephant. One never knows. So we've always got to be uh, open to anticipation and, and see that there could, anything could happen at any moment. As most of you will know, Nikki, Nikki, can you hear me? I copy. Wow, those were beautiful morning glories, hey? Patricia, I've been asking this question to myself the whole morning. Where are the elephants, you know? I was thinking as soon as the, these rains come and these big watering holes start filling up and the mud, would start attracting them and they would all come towards the, the, the water and start playing. That was 
my first inkling this morning that I was going to go to the watering holes and see if I can find any elephants sitting by the watering holes. So, sorry Patricia, I hope, I hope we get to see one in the next 20 minutes. We've got 20 minutes left of drive and I'm going to do my very best to see if we can find one. I'm looking everywhere. But I, I can't tell you that smell of this rain on this landscape is really, really good. I, I want to try and bring that to you as viewers as you're driving along with me on this, on this Saturday morning. It smells very, very fresh. And it's quite strange to actually be wearing a, a jacket in the Sabi Sands. Thanks so much for tuning in to this live safari. Um, you are, you're asking me, do I have any other hobbies other than being out in the wilderness? Yes, I, I, I really do. My favorite hobby is to go surfing and, and to go and catch some really big waves. I'm quite a fan of going out on a big swell. You can imagine often when we have storms like this in Cape Town, we have the opportunity to get good swell that comes into the coast. And my favorite thing in the whole world, if I'm not in the bush, is to be with some of my best friends and going down to the beach and standing on the coastline, looking over the sea and seeing the biggest waves roll in and actually be so nervous. I must say, it's a very similar fe feeling to what I've been having over this interview process of, of talking to many people behind a camera. Um, the same feeling I get when I go and take a big wave, you know, you don't know if you're ready, if you fit enough to be able to catch that wave, and, you know, but sometimes you just got to throw yourself on the line and see what happens, eh? So yes, surfing is my number one hobby. So Carl, I've been told that uh, you also have a hobby, is that uh, the trains that take you to Musenberg. Um, wow, so you, do you live in Cape Town, Carl? Do you know this, do you know that area? Because I used to live, oh. Uh, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> sorry, I didn't realize that you didn't live there. Um, Yes, trains, you know, I used to take the train in Mu Oh! Wow. Guys, it's been a very, very difficult morning to find any animals, and here we have some beautiful, beautiful looking females. Kyle, if you're still watching, would you be able to tell me what females these are? Oh, yes, sorry, there's, are they horns? Can you see horns there? No, it looks like a young male. So it's a young male. Oh, wow, sorry, I should have looked for the horns. Thank you, Nikki, in the control room. There's a female over there, there's a young male right here. I was having a, I've got to learn to try and look at the monitor because I'm looking around and the camera's in another place, so I've got to learn and be, become more synchronistic with this monitor. It's all a little bit of a learning lesson. As you notice, it's starting to quite rain here at the moment. But they're very secretive animals. You can see they have like a disruptive coloration with the white stripes that are going down the sides of their bodies. This helps them blend into this environment. It helps them go through these th thick, this thick vegetation and go hopefully unseen by some of the predators that lurk within its boundaries to find prey. So you can tell that these are very secretive animals. The other secretive animal is a Nyala. 
and the bushback. Ooh. Beautiful champ. So they're very, very secretive animals, and they'll probably most likely carry on walking through this vegetation, browsing on the newly, or browsing on the, on the nice uh, trees, the bush willows that are here. That was great. Uh, that's, that's my first sighting of, uh, of, of some animals this morning. I mean, we saw the hyenas a little bit earlier, but it's nice to see a kudu or even a nyala just now. So it's great. I know I haven't actually been able to see a leopard or a cheetah or a lion since I've been here on my interview process, but that's okay. It's okay. I'm not. It's, I would love to see one. I was, went tracking and looking for them, and it would have been nice to have seen one. And but it's also, you know, it takes time to come back into the bush. It takes time to to just be back in this ecosystem and understand the way in which it works. A year and a half out gives you. It's a long time to not be back. But hopefully, if I get the job, I'll be able to learn more about the ecology, get back into this ecosystem, learn about these female leopards and the, and the leopards that are around here that you guys see day in, day out. In Juma Park. But Kyle, I just want to go... Kyle, back to you. I just want to tell you that I love trains as well. Trains is a I used to take when I was young, when I was probably about 15 years old. I also used to take the train with my surfboard. I used to live in Musenberg, um, and not in Musenberg. I used to travel by train to Musenberg, which is where the nice surf spot was, and that's how I did all my first surfing, was at Musenberg. So I love trains too, Kyle. So everyone guess kudu. Um, of course, I think I'm going to be a little bit harder on you next time. And realize that you guys are experts in the bush here with me, and I'm most certainly not an expert. So I know my my animals and all that all that sort of thing. I don't know what you guys know. So I've been trying to test those waters, and it's good to know that I have a very experienced crew behind me. Um, which is good, it's gonna keep me on my toes. It's gonna keep me learning. We just... Hi there, Dolly in on Ontario. I have had a very uh, scary situation with a black mamba about two years ago. I was walking with a friend of mine and we were walking through the bush and all of a sudden a black mamba just came out of nowhere and it gave me the biggest fright. I must have I'd screamed like a little girl. I'm not going to lie. I had a little bit of a scream, but that was okay. You know, I got over it and that was, that was probably my scariest moment. It's just Black mambas, you know, if they bite you, ooh. Just what I said, you know, these animals are very secretive. Beautiful, I told you, we were gonna see all sorts of secretive animals in the bushes today, everyone. So we can't see him or her anymore. But at least we've got to see a few more animals and tick them off our list on this wet Saturday morning. But yes, just going back to that, um, going back to that question about being scared. That was the scariest moment that I've ever had was with that black mamba. But I also came across uh, male lions uh, during my training. I was walking into the deep, deep south of Londonosi and. I walked and I came across across tracks and you know it was I was very nervous but at the same time I was very excited. Yeah. Once you understand this is a very important fact I think I want to share is that once you understand your nature and your ecology then you know what to do in those situations. 
The reason why people fear sharks, why the people fear lions, why people fear black mambas is, is because they haven't taken the time to understand these animals. And as soon as we take the time to understand animals, then we know how to be with them. So that's a huge thing, and I hope that education in the future worldwide will give us more of an understanding of the way in which animals are in their ecosystems. Because the more that we understand them and experience them, the better, we, better chance we have of conserving the biodiversity on this beautiful planet. And that in itself is a very important thing to understand because we must, un we must know that the biota, which is all the, the trees, the birds, the flowers, are in direct relationship with the atmosphere and the rocks. We can't see anything in separation. So to just simplify what I just said is that we need our biodiversity in order to live on this planet. It's very important. Felicity just asked me a very, very interesting question. You know, I'm just going to stop at anything right now. Let's just stop at this little tree, this little quarry bush over here. Can you zoom in for that, please, Liam? OK, so how would I apply my systems? The question was, how would I apply systems thinking, which I learned within my master's degree, to learning about the way in which uh, I guide? And, you know, everything you know systems approaches learning about the way in which things interact with each other within a system so if we had to stop with any at any tree it doesn't matter what we were looking at and we spent time with it we would learn more about it we'd learn how it is um, in this environment we'll learn about what birds like to eat the berries of the guari bush when it begins the fruit we'll begin to learn about the animals that like to dig beneath it we'll begin to learn about the ants that climb its bark and and over time by spending more time with different systems we can learn more about um, what a systems approach is and 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 that sort of thing that's exactly what i was doing uh, I was going to businesses in Brazil and I was trying to do a systems approach where we stop and you look at the business and you try and understand what influences are very positive for the growth of the glory bush or the business and what was actually quite negative for the growth of the glory bush or the business. So these, you know, we can learn from nature in many, many different aspects. Um, and it's been a huge interest for me and uh, I would be very interested to know if it's an interest for you. Um, because that's something that I'd love to explore a little bit further. How do we begin to understand and learn more about the ecosystem? So just on that fact, the more that we learn about this ecology, the more that I get to learn more about um, Juma Game Reserve, the better I'll get to, to know where to go, where to find tracks, where to find the giraffe, where to find zebra. The more I get to learn about this ecology and the system, the better I'll be able to take you around here and say, do you want to find a zebra? Well, I think I know where to find a zebra. And the last time I saw the leopard, I think I might take you to the same tracks that I saw just last week or weeks before. So everything is about spending time with being patient and learning about the world around you because self implies other. We are because of everything around us. So yeah, that was a great question and that would be my answer. Can you just go close up on that? It's like a millipede. Because well, I don't want to run over any millipedes. All right, everyone. It's been a very, very interesting few days um, for me to be thrown into this context in this environment. I'm going to end as I, uh, with this millipede going back to camp, which is very, very close to here. And I just want to say thank you to every single person that's been part of my interview process, 
it's been a very difficult but very challenge you know challenge is good and it, it helps us learn and helps us see what we can be and what we can produce so I just want to say thank you to all of you that have been part of that experience for me and um, if it works out I hope I get to see you in the future otherwise thank you to the team thank you to the presenters for being here and helping me and encouraging me to get through these difficult and challenging experiences but Thanks, and we're going to go off to Scott to close with him, and hopefully I get to see you again. If not, cheers for now. Well, I'm sure a lot of you are overjoyed by our new friend Sam and just the fact that you've been taken around with somebody with a new perspective and a new outlook on this magnificent wilderness as well as this wonderful uh, experience this live safari experience that we are all so fortunate to be a part of. So I would like to personally congratulate Sam. I've watched a little bit of his drive yesterday and I've no doubt that he also entertained you guys today. So well done. I always fear for new guys coming for an interview. It's a daunting task. And one of these days, somebody is going to freeze or jam up completely on air and I do not want to be around for when that happens so always a relief when guys come in and do a good job which seems to be the trend which is wonderful no joy with the lions or the leopards today but we can all be very happy for the animals of juma and surroundings because of this rain that we've been getting even though it's just been small little installments it's going to really help a lot of the animals out here, mainly the herbivores who are going to be the first animals that get impacted naturally because of their lack of food. So I'm very happy about that and also just happy with this cool weather. Hopefully it stays cool throughout the course of the day and maybe this evening we will get luckier with regards to the bigger mammals like the lions and the leopards. But the rain also brings out a lot of other animals, the snails, a lot of the reptiles, frogs, snakes may become a lot more active. So there is a lot to look forward to on the Sunrise Safari already. It will be James and I taking you out. But for now, we're going to head back to camp, get all the equipment dry and I think it's bacon and eggs today. So the tasty fry up is coming our way, which is going to be very pleasant after this cool morning out. Thanks very much to all of you guys for your questions, contributions, your kind, welcoming gestures to Sam, and also to Nikki, and Kirsty in the final control room, and Dave, who has teamed up with me on camera. We will see you all on the next adventure in a few hours' time. Goodbye.